who doesn't sing along with that little last part? I love that part. Welcome to Story Strategy Live. This is episode 40. We're going to be talking about writing romance all through February. And today we're going to talk about some of the tools you need to master. Hi, Dawn. Hi. How are you today? How are you? I am well. <laughs> well. <laughs> How's your week been? <laughs> it has been a week. Um, generally speaking, it has been fine. But, um, you know, life likes to throw you fun little things to disrupt your very planned schedule. And I'm the kind of person who doesn't do super well with disruptions to my planned schedule. <laughs> so it's it's always a good um, sanity check for me. Like, can I still flex and bend? So this week, the the fun change in our schedule <laughs> was my husband came home from the gym with a ruptured Achilles tendon. And so he needed um, surgery, which he came home Monday, got surgery Wednesday. So it all happened super, super fast, very wow, efficiently. That is fast. Yeah, so you can respect the efficiency there, at least, um, if not the inconvenience of the whole situation. But <clears throat> I imagine it's a lot more inconvenient for him than for me. So just trying to accommodate. <laughs> what did he know, say? Did you hear him? <laughs> I heard him talk. I didn't hear what he well, said. So he, because of this situation, normally he's not around when we do this, but you guys know my desk is in the living room ish, like right inside the front door, and it's an open format house. So it, the the living room where he's recuperating on the couch is just over there, and he can hear everything I say. So <laughs> he said, when I said I imagine it's more inconvenient for him than me, he goes, You imagine that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> He says he said it more jovially than that. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> now, like, you cannot hear me, please. <laughs> is it time for his medication? <laughs> Do Not we need yet. to quiet him down? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any of those pills. <laughs> I should look into getting some. Anyway, how was your week? It, not as adventurous as yours. Mine's been just pretty, it's just a week. Nothing I real exciting happened. Has it been romantic? I mean, after I mean, I being married, you, I, I, you know, <laughs> I've been married for um, 22 years. Wow, that's so, a long time. So, yes, every day is full of romance. I know, I know. Well, and that's um, what... And I was going to say, in fact, my husband just sent me a, a little, you know, sweet little internet meme the other day about what it's like being married in because um, I'm guessing it wasn't sweet. <laughs> well, the, there were several things on on there that very much fit our lives. Um, but one of the things is we constantly have the "you're on my side of the bed" issue, oh, even yes. even though we have a king size bed. I mean, there's plenty of room for everybody. But um, he sent me a meme that was like, you know sleeping together when you're dating and it's like you're all wrapped up with each other and you know snuggling and it's like sleeping together when you're married and it's like your foot came on my side of the bed last night i will punch you in the face if that happens again I will cut you. <laughs> yes. yeah yes. so that's that's romance after 22 years i mean that's just that's just how it is but well and this is he's all right this is pretty pretty on the nose because it's kind of what we're going to talk about um for i mean for the whole month but um sort of, if you're writing romance, like how, yes, you don't want it to be about someone being mad because someone else's foot came on their side of the bed. You don't want it to be that real, but you want it to be authentic. <laughs> now my husband's <laughs> laughing in the other room. It's very distracting. <laughs> um, but you want it to be authentic, right? So yes. you and I both wrote posts this week about different ways to achieve that when writing Sorry, <laughs> when writing romance. Um, maybe I'll let you talk about that. Okay. Because <laughs> I um, have an audience. <laughs> well, we just, we just talked about, in my blog post, we talked about, I talked about how you want to be sure that the moment is authentic to the characters. And we're going to hit a little bit of that as we're going through this. But it's very important that the grand gesture, which is an expectation of the romance genre, which we're going to get to those expectations in a minute, you want that to fit your characters. And right. you want it to not be something that um, doesn't cost the person doing it anything. It has to, there has to be a little bit of a sacrifice involved. Um, 
and it has to meet a need for the other person. Right. So. And I think the story, you guys will have to go read it. Um, Donna's told it before and it's super cute, but the story of how she and her husband ended up deciding that they were right for each other, I guess, or maybe Dawn deciding that she'd give this guy a chance um, was based on this gesture that he made. That's just awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then he's, he's all right. I think I'll keep him. All right. <laughs> 22 years. I mean, you've got a lot of skin in the game at this point. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of, it's a big investment there. They're yeah. so hard to break in new ones, you know, so. <laughs> Seriously. Um, yeah, I just don't even like to think about that. Well, and so that was kind of what I wrote about this morning was, you know, based on this situation that, that we're in kind of what does, what does real love look like? And it's not going to be, you know, in some cases, I hope everybody's real love involves flowers and candlelight and rose petals, but you know, from day to day, real relationships don't look like that. And so if you want to portray a realistic, not realistic, but a relationship that your readers will relate to, then it can't be all, you know, ocean cruises and walks on the beach and, you know, like there's real life going on too. And so you have to be true to that. Well, and you have to get to that layer. You have to right. get past the layer of bringing the flowers and the chocolate and the gifts. And, you know, I put on makeup every single day and I look beautiful all the time. And, you know, <laughs> I never have a bad moment. You have to get past that layer to actually build the real relationship. As demonstrated and, by Mrs. Maisel. Did you ever watch that show? I have not. I've heard it's really good though. I haven't watched a ton of it, but in the first season when she's still in her marriage, she gets up like an hour before her husband so she can make her face up before he sees her because she he's never seen her without makeup on. <laughs> that's real yeah, love. Yeah, no, that's real love. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's the opposite. Um, okay. All right. So let's start off by talking about the difference between romance and a love story. Nicholas Sparks is a love story. Not a romance. <laughs> Nicholas Sparks is a tragedy. Is what often, he is. Often, often a tragedy. Because yeah. okay, let me tell you my quick little Nicholas Sparks story. Um, because uh, I think yeah, I kind of mentioned this in the blog post too. But when I first met my husband, um, we met at church on a Sunday. We'll talk about that another time. But that night after church, he took me out for ice cream and we were sitting there eating ice cream. It's like a sweet and clean romance novel. Um, <laughs> it so at church, we're not the ice cream. <laughs> right. It was so, so sweet. Um, and, and so we were sitting there eating ice cream and he turned and looked at me and he was like, so do you like to read? <laughs> And, and after like, you, you recovered from passing out. Right. I was like, you know, and he's, yes, a swoon, little hard <laughs> eyes, like the little, you know, little anime characters or whatever. And he said, I just finished this book called The Notebook. And it's by, <laughs> it's by Nicholas somebody. And he was like, it was a really good book. And amazingly, I hadn't heard of it. Oh. And so I, because this was before the movie, this was, you know, he's like, I just, it was just a really good book and, you know, it was kind of cool and everything. And um, so I went home after that date and I lived in the same apartment complex as my aunt and my aunt had like walls and walls of books. And so I literally like ran to her apartment and was like, I need this book. I know you have to have had it. And that's, you know, and she's like, uh, you know, like the librarian. Uh, oh, yeah. this one. Just and, my Dewey Decimal System. Oh, here exactly. it is. <laughs> and so, like, I read it that, like, that. It's not a very thick book. No, I read it like that book. night or the next afternoon or something. So yeah, Nicholas Sparks well, can tear your heart into pieces in just a few pages. Like, he doesn't yes. need a, a lot of words to do it. <clears throat> and so, while I, I have a soft spot for him in my heart, he does not write romance. No. Because people die every single time. Don't get attached to anybody because he's going to kill them off, including the dog. This so people happen. die all the time in his books. So that is not romance. He's, he's writing a love story. people can die in a romance. So that, that isn't what we're getting at. You can kill someone if you really want to and if you have a good reason. But certain people can die. <laughs> the hero or the heroine. Unless right. you're writing paranormal or zombie or something where that person is immediately going to be resurrected. And Don and yes. I were exploring the idea of necromancer romance. I suggest somebody write that ASAP. It's going to be hot. Yeah. 
Because uh, you can't kill hmm. off, you cannot kill off the main character. Do not let me get invested in these people and be start rooting for them. And they're finally going to be together and they kiss. And then a train runs over one of them. Don't do that to me. <laughs> That's not well, nice. There is a place for that kind of book. And people do enjoy those types of twists. They are not romance readers. No. Um, and if you then, this is, I think, where we need to have the unique, my, my unique unicorn conversation. Um, because we now and then we'll meet a writer who will tell us that they, they should go ahead and do that even when we're like, no, 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 you can't do that in a romance. And they're like, well, but I mean, this isn't your typical romance. What I'm writing is totally different. So there's a couple of issues with that, right? One, you can't call it a romance if you kill off one of the either the hero or the heroine, or if it's a reverse harem and you've got a whole bunch of heroes and heroines, you can't kill them off. Don't. It's not a romance, it's something else. So you don't get to call it that. And that creates a whole nother problem. Because if you aren't gonna market it as a romance, and yet you, in your head it's a romance, what is it and how are you gonna market it? And so a right. lot of a lot of first time writers don't think about this because they're not thinking about marketing the book, they're thinking about writing the story and that's where you should be. Mm -hmm. But, um, and Don and I were kind of chatting about this before we got live. You'll find a couple people who will love your I'm killing the heroine story. You'll find people who are like, this is the best thing I've ever read. It's amazing. It's so unique and fantastic and wonderful. Everyone should read it. But everyone will not read it. Your people who want to read a romance will either be super pissed if they read it and find out that this happens, or they will hear that this happens and they will not read it. And so if you need to pay bills or anything with your writing income, that is definitely not the way to get there. At least not at first. Like Nora Roberts at this point could probably manage it. Oh yeah. But, but she's Queen Nora. She could do anything she wants. Well, and she's only written 250 books to get there. So at right. least, you know, get your loyal followers first before you start killing off the people they love. That is my advice. Well, and that's like you said repeatedly, if you're mm -hmm. labeling it as a romance, if you want to market it as a romance, the, and we're going to get into some more things here in a minute, but the happily ever after is non-negotiable. Yes. They, they have to end up together. They have to end up alive or dead together, living in another world. However you want to work that out. The living in um, another world part is important because otherwise we've got a whole Romeo and Juliet and that's a tragedy. Yes. A, yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, Real quick, let's hit the other part of how you can tell the romance between between a romance and a love story. Because sometimes they don't kill everybody off. We kind of got caught up on that. People live, but it's still not a romance. Right. And the difference there, a good test is if you could lift the romance out of the story, do you still have a story? So, and this happens in other genres. Like if you're looking at a romantic suspense or if you're looking writing paranormal if you took the two people in a romantic suspense and didn't have them romantically re become involved with each other does your story still hold up right. and if you can then it's normally considered like a suspense with romantic elements rather than a romantic suspense right a romance is about the romance that is your main yes. plot line so Keep that in mind. I think a lot of times um, people try to overcomplicate romance because they forget that there's plenty of intrigue and interest to be found in two people figuring each other out. And there is an external plot going on. I mean, they're not two people in a closet unless we're talking about um, that Laura K book. What was that? Hearts in the Darkness, I think. They're, they're trapped in an elevator. The whole book, it's oh. black. They can't even see each other. So that's a whole other thing. <laughs> You have to be Laura Kay to do that. Um, that would send me into a panic attack. I'm just true. saying that would not I be a good experience. It, but it's super popular. It's gotten a ton of rave reviews and readers talk about it all the time. So she managed, mm -hmm. anyway, I don't remember why I brought that up. Oh, because there, there's an external story happening right. around your characters most of the time. And in, in that there was too, there was, they're stuck in an elevator. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, and Julie, we did hit on Nicholas Sparks at the beginning. You're going to have to rewatch. We, we kind of beat that. What do I say? We nailed the horse into the ground. <laughs> nailed the dead horse. Yeah. Um, and Amanda <laughs> pointed out that Finley Grant will be publishing a necromancer romance. And I yes. should have known that. I don't know Finley Grant. I that. can tell you that that book had a really fabulous editor. And I had forgotten. 
about it until just now. So did you edit yes. that book? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you edited a necromancer romance and it didn't occur to you to mention. <laughs> but okay. thank you, Amanda, for pointing that out because Finley is awesome. That book is really good and it's just been it's it's been a while. It's okay. been <laughs> time. Like time has no meaning at this point. Okay, okay so let's talk about right. when romance genre expectations. What do you gotta have? What do they expect? Okay. Well, and so again, going back to that whole unique unicorn idea, it's it's tempting to think that you're going to surprise readers and that they'll like that. Because I mean, as a reader, yes, I love that. I love being surprised. But I like being surprised in literary fiction, in women's fiction, in thrillers. But in romance, the prime readership who you are trying to woo, um, to use a romance term, is expectant. They have very specific desires. They know what they like and mm -hmm. they will go looking for that exact thing. Motorcycle club, secret baby. Like these are the things they search <laughs> for. Um, and so if you do not deliver that certain thing, and I swear to God, it took me six years probably to figure this out because I did not believe it because I was sure I could write something that people would just like so much that it wouldn't matter. And it was Melanie Harlow who over and over again was like, what are you doing? <laughs> they want cake. <laughs> Just give them cake. Right. <laughs> don't make a fancy pie. They don't want that. <laughs> so there are certain expectations that if you are writing a romance, you need to pay tribute to. The first one we already talked about is the happily ever after, or at least happy for now. So your two main characters or three or seven or however many you've got working in this romance must end up happy at the end of your book. Yes. Right? <clears throat> They're going to end up together. And I know that when I pick up a romance, if I'm no. looking for a romance, I pick it up. I know they're going to end up together. That's why I'm picking up this they romance. They want cake. They don't want to bite into the cake and then find out that it's got a rock in the middle of it because it's a surprise rock cake. Like they want cake. Right. Yes. I want my cake. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Generally, well, I, would, I was going to ask your opinion on this. I feel like in the romance genre, there's a general expectation of a dual POV. I think that's pretty modern. Um, okay. I don't, I don't think that that was necessarily true even as recently as five years ago, but I think today, absolutely most, at least contemporary romance is going to be a dual POV. I don't read a ton of historical, so I definitely can't speak to that. I know that paranormal often is closer to women's fiction um, and has a heavy female POV. Um, I'm trying to think of examples, but I think if you're writing contemporary or rom-com, then unless you're really pushing into the chiclet area with, you know, the whole illustrated cover and I don't know, there's a lot of crossover there and women's fiction is usually from the woman's point of view. A single POV. Yeah. But I think dual POV is a pretty safe. And what about first or third person? Do you have a thought on that? I don't, I don't, I can, I like both actually, um, as long as, because we know my slight obsession, as long as you're giving me a deep POV that I feel like I'm actually experiencing that story, it doesn't matter to me if it's first or third. And yeah. I know some people, and this is just things that I've heard. I know some people, and we're going to get into heat levels in a minute, but the higher the heat level, the less they want it to be in first person. Really? Because I've heard, I've heard some people, and this is friends of mine being like, it's just too close at that point. <laughs> Isn't that why they're but, reading? <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Huh. So I think either one works very well. It just depends on how well you're writing that POV. But I think it's very important in romance to make sure if we're talking about dual POV, whether you're writing third or first, that the male sounds like a male. Yeah. And oh, absolutely. Because my that's husband, that's a whole other writing craft thing, authentic yes. voice. But my husband's favorite line about that is, "We don't talk that way. You all, y'all want us to talk that way, but we're <laughs> not going to talk that way." And so, I think it's important when you're doing the the POVs to make sure that your voices are distinctive. But it doesn't bother me if it's first or third or present or past or whatever. I do think that in contemporary and in rom com, first person is not necessarily the expectation, but I'm seeing a whole lot more leaning in that direction than third. I know my PA absolutely hates 
third person. I don't know why, because I, I like it. But every time I write anything in third and she looks at it, she's like, why? <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> don't do that. Um, okay. One other thing. So we always talk about goals, right, Don? You're big on mm -hmm. character goals and motivation. So in a romance, your character's goals are a, are not just like, I really want a boyfriend. Like, yes, right. they're focused on the romance in some way, but their, their real driving goal, the thing that brings them into the story, has nothing to do with that other person that they're going to fall in love with. It has to be something that's intrinsic to them and what is going to make them happy as a person, right? Right. Generally, well, not generally. I hate to say never, but I have yet to see a strong romance where the heroine's internal goal was to fall in love. Usually the falling in love is a disruption to whatever their goal is. You know, right. now their goal, their goal may be to get a date or their goal may be, especially because if you get into like the fake relationship trope, right. there's a lot of fun with that of their goal is to pretend like they're in love, but they're not actually going to fall in love. That's not on the agenda at all. Right. So those are always fun. They, you've got to have an external force pushing on them. You've got to have that conflict and friction coming from someplace outside of them too. Right. Did you watch Bridgerton or ever? Read I it? haven't yet. And I need to, because everybody in the world has told me that I need to, including my 17 year old son. Oh, so really? yeah, that tells me there's, there's something there I need to see. So it's fun. It's super fun. And I, I'm, I don't read a ton of historical, as I already said, I do read Eloisa James. Um, I had not read um, Bridgerton, but I did watch it. And I'm curious what you think, because I mean, you're familiar with the whole like debutante, um, you know, bringing a lady into society and the entire point of all that, you know, back in the Regency period and probably earlier and later was to marry her off to, you know, mm -hmm. present her to the eligible bachelors and make a good match. So in that, um, I assume the book, but for sure the miniseries, the main character's goal was basically, to, and she was very romantic about it. She wanted to fall in love. So you could almost say that her goal was to fall in love. So that might be a bit of a contradiction to our argument, although really her goal was to make her family proud, to find a good match, to do what was expected of her. Yeah, I think the falling in love can be a partial goal as far as like sometime in the future, I want to be happy and have and that kind of thing. Um, I don't think the setting out of I'm going to go fall in love is a strong enough goal to carry an entire book. Yeah, well, and that, I'm not trying to say that that was her goal because now that I'm really thinking about it, it was, I mean, this, you'll go watch it and then we can talk about it. You're better watch at it. digging through but, that. Um, <laughs> it's Julia Quinn, right? I think so. That's why I didn't say the author's name because I can't okay. remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll go with that. that. Right. <laughs> Does anyone know? So, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's who it is. We'll see if right. somebody, yeah, somebody in the comments pop up for us and, and confirm that for us. Um, so yeah, when you're talking about the character's goals and one of the things that we need to touch on too is the wound. Because yes. that's going to come up a lot in this series that we're doing. Brooke confirmed. You, yes, Julia yes. Quinn. Thank you. Um, that's going to come up a lot in the series is the, whatever their wound now their wound can absolutely be related to falling in love. It almost has to be. It, yes, it has to be related to relationships somehow. Relationships, not necessarily directly related to themselves in relationships, but it's almost always going to be some kind of assumption that they have or some misbelief about, a rela about relationships based on something that happened to them, something that happened to their best friend, something that happened to their mother, the way they were raised, you know, something. Mm -hmm. Something they've seen. Yeah, something that's super close and meaningful to them, though. So, and that usually is going to be related to the relationship. All right. What else? So, let's look at some of the like structural, because we know that story structure is my thing. Let's look at some of the structural things that are expected. Let's talk about the meat cute. My husband hates that word. Every time I say it, he calls it cute meat. And he thinks I because it's a romance that. that we're talking about something else. Cute, <laughs> cute meat. He just yelled out, I have cute meat. Yes. <laughs> we're we're like? sure he does. <laughs> yes, yes, I understand completely. So how soon in a typical romance, and I'm, I'm saying typical because I know we're going to end up with, well, but it didn't do this one. It didn't do, how soon do they need to meet? 
So I like to have, and I follow the Romancing the Beat, which is the book that we're giving away this month. Um, or I, I mean, it's also kind of my own, I, I morphed Romancing the Beat into something I call signposts, which you can learn about if you go take the plotting course that's on our Teachable page. Um, Cause it's a lot of Romancing the Beat with, a, it just, I don't know, it works better to me. But basically to answer your question, you meet the heroine or the, or the hero, and then you meet the other one. If you're writing dual POV, they each get their own kind of intro chapter, even if it's just a few paragraphs so that you know who, who we're gonna be dealing with here. And then the very next chapter should be they're meeting each other. And it can be a momentary, like, you know, they might stand in line together at a coffee shop and exchange three words and then go on about their lives. But that was that you need to know that these people are going to meet up. So pretty quickly, normally in a normal normally, yeah. romance. Now there's some like, if you look at like Sleepless in Seattle, they don't meet till the very end, which is not a great example because it kind of, denies all of the rules. Um, now I'm going, is that a romance? <laughs> I, we'd have to dig it, dig through it to really decide it, on that. It follow the, the rules we're going to lay out. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so maybe Don't bring that up. <laughs> didn't say that. So you got your cute meat. You want it to be something authentic and you yeah. want it to be something pretty memorable I won't go off on my tangent about people running into each other, but we all know how I feel about that. And then, that. <laughs> and then um, one of the things that I know has come up in the past with um, some authors I've worked with, especially brand new authors, is if you are writing a second chance romance, if these people have met before, the cute meet is when they meet that leads to the romance. You're saying it's it not, the way my husband does now. Are you doing that on purpose? No. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> you were calling it the cute meat. <laughs> the meat cute, meat cute. Um, it's yeah, it's when, not when they first meet, right? Like right. When if they met on the playground, yes. Yeah. And if you're doing a friends to lovers, again, the meat cute is that, and it's that one can get a little muddled sometimes, but it's more that moment because you start on the day when something different happens. It's more that moment where somebody realizes there's a bit of a spark there. Right. It's the, that meaningful look all of a sudden, or I don't know, I can think of a million things, but yeah, it's not just another day in the life of these two friends. It's, it's right. something has changed and oh, we both recognize it. And then they of course run. Yes. <laughs> it's so, um, so when I, we're, we're working with the uh, romance clients, we talk about the meet cute. Am I saying it yes. right now? Yes. <laughs> meet cute. <laughs> no, I have to think and, about then, it. <laughs> and then we talk about you need something that either brings them together or pull, pulls them apart. You need a reason why they can't be together right then. Yeah. Normally. But you need a reason why they have to be together. Right. So, and, yeah. You're, I mean, a romance is like this, right? It's it's a pushing and pulling. And that's what creates all that tension that readers want that makes them keep turning pages until finally you get the big one. Yes. It's a will they or won't they? Yes. And so you, you toy a little bit. But so it, to structure it, you want to set up a situation where, you know, they <clears throat> they meet, they are forced somehow to be together. And it could even be, you know, they're stranded in a cabin or... Mm -hmm that's a forced proximity force. But a lot of times it's it's not as obvious as that. It's a working situation or it's a mutual friend situation or they're both in a wedding or, you know. Um, and then r the reasons why they can't just be like, oh, hey, I like you, you like me, okay, let's be together, are usually like, um, I live in a different city and I have to go home in two weeks because my mother is sick and or, you know, it, throw anything in there. It doesn't matter. But there has to be a good reason why they can't just be like, yeah, let's let's totally get together, right? And if they would, did, they would say it in that voice. I was going to say, is that how they talk? Is that the <laughs> Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to throw one more thing into your hatred of people bumping into each other. Spilling coffee okay. or any other beverage. Yeah, or anything. Yes, there's lots of spilling. spilling. Lots of lots of spilling. Drinks. It's A, it's messy. B, it's just don't do that. It's enough. Yeah. It's enough already. It's become very cliche. Mm -hmm. Very, very cliche. Yes. All right. 
Oh, the fun topic. Let's talk about sex, Dawn. <laughs> yes, let's do that. And we're going to have in this series, we're going to have a whole show dedicated to talking about writing sex, how you get over the fact that your mother is going to be watching or reading it someday or your neighbor to do this one. <laughs> I was going to say, I think we need your husband not around for that one. I'm sure he would pull up. Everyone is always he here all the time. <laughs> I'm sure he would provide delightful commentary for us. Would you um, like him to do that episode, actually? I'm sure he'd have a lot to say about it. I'm sure he would, too. Um, but we will give y'all a heads up on that one so you can clear the room, put in your earbuds, whatever you need to do, because there, that's a big part of it. Do you think we'll use um, explicit terms? Is that why people need to clear the room? Well, no, but if you've got little kids... I don't want to be the one who's responsible for the where do babies come from talk. I don't, <laughs> that's not what I want to do for y'all. So I know that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> so I haven't seen the notes for that episode yet. <laughs> Can't wait. That one, but it's going to be fun. You know, it's going to be fun. So yeah, when you were looking at writing a romance, let's talk about heat levels on yeah. sex. There's a lot of disagreement about this. Honestly, I think clearly we know what erotica is, right? So in erotica, you don't need a, a plot um, that is separate from your two characters. And most of <laughs> the time they spend together will be focused on the erotic element of the story. Um, so erotica is a chance to explore, you know, fetishes and, and interests that aren't necessarily mainstream in, in the world. They're pretty mainstream in terms of erotica. Um, although you can find stuff, I mean, there's dinosaur porn, so whatever you can yeah, find there's whatever all you want. sorts of whatever and, floats your boat, it's out there. And I'm going to kind of suggest that that is a different genre. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it, we're talking about romantic relationships, kind of in erotica, but really, when we talk about romance, we're 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 going from you know a very clean, nothing's happening on the page kind of human relationship building to open door sex scenes with explicit language about body parts and stuff. Um, that's kind of the realm I think of romance. So how do you break up the classifications in there? And there's a lot of discrepancies or disagreement um, about what does sweet mean? What does clean mean? What does steamy mean? And I can't tell you that we have the answers to those questions. Um, I would suggest that anything that is labeled sweet or clean has either closed door scenes where, you know, fade to black, let's go in here and the door closes and you don't see any of the stuff happen or, you know, they don't even, it's not addressed at all. You have no reason to believe that these characters are having sex. You know that they are romantically interested in each other and there might be kissing or handholding or right. maybe a bit of stroking, but nothing else. Um, and then as far as like differentiating between hot and steamy and whatever else, it's all, you know, like once you get, once the doors open, the door's open. Well, and I was taught the same thing about um, erotic romance, as we talked about, about the love story versus, versus romance of if you could, if the characters could never have sex on the page and still fall in love, then it's not an erotic romance that the erotic romance, the sex is a required element because it's uh, what the story is about. It's about that kind of journey. Um so we'll get into that more during our other episode and we'll get into some of the, the different levels, but you kind of see one of the th trends that I've seen lately is especially if you're like, Oh, I'm going to write contemporary romance. There is a large, vast variation between, well, is it a sweet romance or is it a contemporary romance and what, what language they use and how graphic the descriptions are. There's a, a vast amount of variation there. Um, and we'll probably also talk to you about there's some people who very strongly disagree with using the term term clean for right. a romance that doesn't have sex in it. Because and it so, casts anything that has sex in it as somehow dirty and derogatory. Right. And and I don't like that. that implication. So we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit later and we'll also give you some tips on if you are embarrassed about what you're writing and um, how to do research <laughs> oh we probably won't include links but if you're gonna 
if you're gonna how how do you um because what i've i've noticed working with a lot of authors who are just starting out too is it's not so much i'm uncomfortable writing about sex it's i'm uncomfortable writing about sex poorly and so we'll help you on that we have a whole episode dedicated to giving you the tools you need to make sure that doesn't happen so right. but uh, I, I would think add one other thing in the heat levels discussion. Um, once you land on a heat level, you stick there. Um, that's your brand. Because, yes, you can write outside your genre and all that good stuff. That's a whole other conversation. But as a romance writer, your readers, as we talked about, there's a huge, vast, like, there's all these differences in contemporary romance. So once you say, I am writing contemporary romance, here is my brand name. The readers who find you will expect that that's where you're gonna be. So if they like that heat level, they're gonna come back to you for it. If it's too much or too little for them, they'll go find it somewhere else. So once you're, you know, if you're writing practically closed door, the second book in the series should not be practically erotica. Um, you kind of have to, at least in the series, stay in the same place. And then if yes. you're gonna veer away from that in your next, series indicate it in your blurb so that the readers that like that heat level know that this is going to be different. Yes. Um, Julie has a question that says male POV. Are you talking about in writing sex scenes? Should you include a male POV? Um, if you're writing dual POV, that? then yeah. Um, I would suggest that depending on how you want to do it, if there's only one in the book, half of it is in his and half of it is in hers. If you're going to have more than one, then you could do one in hers, one in his and vary it. But yeah, I think we need that. Yes. And I think readers really enjoy getting to see how the, um, because, and we'll talk about this on that other episode, but the sex isn't just about the sex. It's always about the emotion. I think I'm going to need a glass so of wine for that episode. <laughs> What? Oh. <laughs> Julie is talking about we okay, so for those of you who don't know what we all just started laughing about, it's because Julie's next comment was Nancy's husband. Julie was talking about your husband offering us the male point of view oh, on, on this which, which on the, the sex episode of offering the male point of view. We're not gonna um, have that happen. No. No. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants that, trust me. <laughs> but, but what I was filling in in my brain is readers do enjoy seeing the emotion from the male side. They do enjoy wanting to know that the male is completely, and that was something that popped up in my brain just a minute ago that I did not put in the notes. Um, romance readers want to know that that hero is only for that heroine. Oh, yeah. And so you don't want him thinking about other women during any kind of intimate moments at all. And a lot of times romance readers will not tolerate cheating. Oh, true, so yeah. there's, there's a specific genre that does address that. But generally, even if the guy has been with 50 other women and this is the woman that's going to calm him down, which is a trope that you do see, we don't want to see him with any of those other women. And so when you're having, putting in these heat levels, even if it's a closed door scene, it's a little awkward sometimes, of he's only for her. That's it. Right. And I think that sometimes we see um, when people are writing the male POV, and this probably comes from life experience, um, they focus more on the physical um, and when they go, when they give his POV of what he's thinking while this is all happening, a lot of it sometimes gets really heavy into the the purely physical. I think what 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 romance readers also want to see, in addition to that, is that it's not it's not all about what's going on here, the physical. It's it's about you know why this is happening and how I feel about this happening and you know why you're the only person who I want this to happen with that kind of thing. So just be careful about being too heavy on the you know. The sex part. Well, and there's always a repercussion, good or bad. The sex always changes something. Right. And it always advances the story in some way. Right. And so we'll we'll talk more about that. Like I said, we got a whole episode planned on it that's going to be a lot of fun that we're not inviting Nancy's husband to, or mine for that matter. <laughs> this is oh, I'm going to be in a closet <laughs> for that one. <laughs> well, and we've got, we've got some... 
we've got some male viewers. So if they want to pop it in the comments, we got that. So, um, okay. <laughs> black moment. Let's talk about the black moment. Let's do that. How is that different in a romance than in a thriller? Well, in a thriller, it's often the the bad guy seems to have gotten away or there's absolutely no hope of solving the mystery. Something really terrible has happened. Another person has died even when we thought we had captured the killer. Um, it's that kind of thing. But in a romance, it's pretty specifically about the romance. It's a moment when something leads to these people who have previously been like, okay, maybe we can be together. Suddenly being like, nope, absolutely not. There's absolutely no way this will work. And they have to yes. break up. Um, and the worse the breakup, the better. Yes, except, so here's, here's where you hit a balance there. Because you got to get the reader worried. You got to create that tension where the reader's worried, like, okay, and in, and in a romance, because I know that they're going to end up together in the end, the tension comes from, okay, how are they going to fix this? Right. Or if it's a new author to me, I'm like, how am I going to end up not throwing this book against the wall if they aren't back together in the next 50 pages, you know? But you also have to be careful with the breakup that it has to be something they can come back from. Oh, right. Yeah. Like he cannot say the things that she will never, ever forget that he said. Like, <laughs> right. You can't unring a bell. It, yes. So, there are certain names he does not need to use or, or she, same, same difference arguing back. Right. Um, you can poke a wound, but you can't shove a hot poker into it because right. it has to be something you can recover from. And it well, has so to be something that the readers will support you recovering from. And what you just said about the wound is important because a lot of times breaking up has to do with the wound. It's a fear. Um, generally, it happens because one of the characters cannot overcome the fear or the wound that was preying on them in the back of their mind through the whole thing. And a lot of times what happens is the other character will call it to the forefront or make them look at it and they just aren't ready. And so that's why they'll be like, okay, no, I thought I could do this, but I can't do this. And so they run away. Right. And the wound is but, fundamental sometimes to the black moment. Yes. And then that character who runs away, they have to work through that because just showing up and saying, I'm sorry, isn't enough. No, they have to go to the goddess. Yes. <laughs> That's the thing. Oh, I, I know. I just <laughs> always just picture like this person sitting there with a glowing head and all this. It, but they, it doesn't have to be a goddess. It could be a dog, but they have to have a meaningful, doesn't have to be dialogue. It's, there is moment. usually some kind of reflective moment. Generally, it involves another wiser person or something that makes them reflect. It could even be a mirror. Um to make them realize the error of their ways and figure out how to overcome. Yes. Cause there needs to be evidence of change because if their whole thing has been, I was cheated on by somebody who lied all the time and they find out that their partner was less than truthful with them about something and they completely blew it out of control and called them a liar or whatever. And then they just show up and they're like, I'm sorry you got upset when I called you a liar. <laughs> That's not going to fix anything. <laughs> I'm sorry you are having a problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or I'm just, I'm sorry that I, you know, did this. But I, there has to be evidence that something has changed. Right. It has to cost them something to apologize. And there should be groveling involved. I mean, and the person who messes up the most is the one that has to do the groveling and the grand gesture, which we're going to talk about. Absolutely. Yes. And so yes. the so grand gesture comes next, right? So there's always a black moment and then there's always a grand gesture in romance and it's sometimes grander than others. Um, I like a big grand gesture. More, the more like music and dancing that can be involved, the better. Um, but generally it's, it's got to involve something that is unique to the story that is super meaningful to the person to whom the gesture is being made. So it's not just showing up with a ring and proposing and saying, gosh, I was a moron. I really love you. It's, you know, like the, I don't know, the only example I can think of now, and I'm not saying this is a fantastic example. It's just the one that's in my head is um, in shaking the sleigh. It was, 
it was a Christmas story. And so he, I don't remember exactly all the details, but he did like a Christmas Carol thing. Um, and so he had her, she was in a hotel room. She was getting ready to go to the airport the next morning. And he had her, the guys in the lobby, like send a signal up to her TV and he could broadcast from there. And so he had the ghost of Christmas past, which was someone from her past, a ghost from Christmas present. And then he, or future. And then no, he was the future. I don't know, but he there was, was a whole future. bunch of thing outside and it was very big and Christmassy and Charles Dickens like, and. Well, if you've ever seen um, Iron Man three, I think it is that starts off with um, Iron Man has given, has given Pepper this stuffed rabbit. That's like the size of their house. Like she pulls up and looks at this rabbit and it's like, what is that? That could be a huge grand gesture. It's a big stuffed rabbit that's like two stories tall and she hates it. The whole It becomes a thing the whole time. Yeah. So it has to be something that means something to that character and it costs the person who's making the grand gesture something. Because like, for example, Iron Man has you know more money than the entire world. So him buying this giant stuffed rabbit doesn't cost him anything. So if for him, a grand gesture would be something smaller and um, more heartfelt. like more heartfelt, like finding something that's important to her instead right. of giving her a huge 18 karat ring. It's here's this really small, cute ring that I know you love because I got it from your grandmother or so it has to be a connection that really shows there was a change in the behavior. It's important to the other character and it costs them something. Yeah, what Dawn said. And the happily ever after comes next, obviously, or the happy for now. And then generally, at least in contemporary and rom-com, there is an epilogue because readers like to see that this is going to stick. So you'll usually, you can do the epilogue like the next day. Um, you want to give them a taste of what life is going to be like now that everything's okay, now that they're together. So you show them another real world slice of life kind of thing, but it has to have enough tension to keep them reading. And right. um, so a lot of times it's the wedding or it's, you know, she's pregnant or it's five years later. Um, so it's something that gives them a glimpse of, of what's going to happen. You have to be careful with the five years later thing, because if you're writing a series and anyone's going to make a cameo, it starts to get the timeline kind of fuzzy because then you don't know like who's had children. Who's going to be where. Yeah, so I try not to throw them too far out into the future just in case. Well, but an epilogue is a perfect place to tease the next book in your series too. Definitely. I yes. mean, it's the perfect place to, it's the wedding and then this person shows up at the wedding who hasn't been in town in years, suddenly a problem for the best man and oh, what's going to happen there? So right. there's a perfect, it's a perfect place to tease the next book. Although I highly recommend not throwing in two brand new people in an epilogue. Like, right. Yeah. You definitely one keep of one of the characters that, that you already know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they looked across the clearing and there was Julie and Scott. <laughs> we have no idea who they are, but. <laughs> oh, look, they're back from their long trek away from here. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So, so that covers what we had to talk about. Do y'all have any questions y'all want to throw out for us while we're here? And I was worried we weren't going to have enough material. We've gone on for 50 minutes, Dawn. Oh, Lord. We we can talk romance. We can. Um, we well, while we're waiting for any questions to pop up, let's talk about um, what we have going on. Most importantly, there is a brand new um, course available called Story Fuel. Conflict Stakes Tension. Am I missing something? Conflict it's Stakes It's propelling your... Propelling your plot with conflict, stakes, and tension. Yes. Yes. So you can check that out. If you are in our story saloon, there is a um, discount code in there. And oh, Terry wants to know if guys can write good romance for women. Yes. I, I think they absolutely can. Mickey Miller is a great example of a very popular male romance writer. Jacob Chance is another one. Um, I think there's a Logan Chance too. I haven't read that him. Maybe that sounds right. There's a but few yes, I absolutely, I absolutely believe that guys can write good romance for women. You just have to be open to doing a lot of research and reading a lot of romance books written by women so you know what they're looking for. 
Exactly. I think, yeah, women have the edge only because our, the audience tends to be women. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a little easier being on that side, I guess. <laughs> um, there's a couple other names being popped up here, but um, the other thing to throw out there is that uh, I was about to say there's a discount code in the story strategy saloon for Dawn's new class. Um, if you are on our newsletter list, you'll, you got a discount code this last newsletter for all of the courses that are available. Um, and if you go into the saloon and ask for it, I bet one of us might be nice enough to share that with you. Um, so go check out the courses. And if you're not on the newsletter list, you should subscribe because this month we're giving away Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hayes, which is a fantastic book on writing romance. Um, and what else do we need to talk about? Well, we need to mention, you mentioned it briefly while we were going through, but we need to mention that Nancy has a course that hits all of these bases for you on writing romance and that coupon code works for that. And then, so next week, I'm very excited about this. Okay, yeah. Next week, we will be sharing romance, like real life examples of romance. And we're going to have and some get really, really awesome guests talk about their real life romance. So some authors who you know, since I don't have the videos in hand yet, I don't want to tease them by name just in case, but um, we'll have at least three very well-known romance writers talk about how they met their significant others and recommend one of their favorite romance books to you. Yes. And so we'll have a chance for y'all in the comments to talk about your romance. Nancy and I are going to talk about ours a little bit. So next week is going to kind of be a fun here's some story inspiration, that kind of thing, because it's the Thursday before Valentine's day. And I just less, like that idea. Less craft more fun. Less craft more fun. And then after Valentine's day, we have the love hurts episode, which we're strongly going to focus on wounds and ghosts and flaws and how you weave that into the romance, how it plays. We touched on a little bit today, but we're really going to get into how it's going to drive your story, how it feeds into that black moment, how it feeds into the grand gesture, all of that. And then February 25th is when we're going to talk about sex. So that's we're going to have that long to find a safe it, place. OMG, my mom's going to read this. <laughs> so right. that is what we have for you this month. And that is it for us tonight. Thanks for hanging out with us and we'll see you again next week.